Good afternoon. I'm going to go out and come in again. Good afternoon. Much better. That too. I'm not even going to try. Um, I'm Charlie Robbins, Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education here at Stony Brook, and really pleased to welcome all of you to today's Provost Lecture. Um, before I start the introductions, I just want to ask everybody to please silence your cell phones. Um, it, it's disruptive both to the speaker and, and to audience members when they go off during, during sessions. So thank you for that. So let me start by um, congratulating the Hispanic Heritage Committee for all the wonderful programs that they're sponsoring this year. I think each year the, the list of programs gets better and better and longer and longer, but especially for bringing Dr. Zayas to our campus today. I'd like to acknowledge some of the co-sponsors for today's program. Um, along with the Office of the Provost, Dr. Mark Sedler, the Chairman of the Department of Psychiatry, Dr. Francis Brisbane, the Dean of the School of Social Welfare, and I just want to take a, a minute, take a, the privilege of introducing uh, Iris Feinberg. Dr. Feinberg is the new Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the School of Social Welfare. So, Iris, you want to stand up for a second and welcome her? As some of you know, that's a position that I sort of know pretty well, so I'm really pleased that, that she's here and, and doing that. The National Association of Puerto Rican and Hispanic Social Workers, Dr. Ken Koshansky, Senior Vice President of Health Sciences and the Dean of the School of Medicine. Dr. Lisa Belitis, the Dean of the School of Nursing and Chief Nursing Officer, who I also saw right here. So Lee is right here. The Hispanic Heritage Month Planning Committee and Dr. Paul Furbus, the Director of the Latin American and Caribbean Study Center. So let's give all the co-sponsors a round of applause, please. It's truly a, a personal honor and privilege for me to, to be able to introduce Dr. Zayas um, as our speaker for this afternoon session. He is the first Shanti Kanduka Distinguished Professor of Social Work at the George Warren Brown School of Social Work at Washington University in St. Louis. Those of us in the world of academic social work know and understand that it's both an honor and a burden holding a chair in the name of Dr. Kanduka. He's an active faculty member there um, and was the dean at, at George Warren Brown for over 30 years. Dr. Zayas has held numerous administrative positions at Washington University, including being the associate dean for faculty. He's active in the, in the Washington University community, serving on the Chancellor's Coordinating Council on Diversity Initiatives and the Provost's Work Group on Diversity. He's the founder and director of the Center for Latino Family Research, a center which is devoted to generating knowledge for developing and adapting effective programs and interventions that address the most pressing social, economic, and health issues faced by Latino families. Their mission is twofold. First, to conduct basic and applied research across the lifespan of Latino families in the U.S. and their counterparts in Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. And second, to train graduate students, doctoral candidates, postdoctoral fellows, and visiting scholars from the United States and Latin America in research that improves the lives of all Latino families. Some of the areas that they focus on are Latino acculturation from pre to post immigration, Hispanic health, mental health, and substance abuse, developing, adapting, and tailoring interventions for Latino children, youth, and families, Hispanic marriage enrichment, cultural competency, and access to all services. Prior to joining um, the George Warren Brown School in St. Louis, Dr. Zayas was a visiting associate professor of family medicine at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and a professor at the Graduate School of Social Service at Fordham University. He received his PhD from Columbia University as well as a Master's of Philosophy 
a Master's of Arts in Developmental Psychology and a Master's in Social Work. He have to get that in. He's the chair of the Research Committee for the National Alliance for Hispanic Families in Washington, D.C., and volunteers with local immigrant groups in the St. Louis area. And this is very exciting. Effective January 1, 2012, Dr. Zayas will assume the position of Social Work Dean at the University of Texas at Austin, following Dr. Barbara White, who actually spoke here a number of years ago. Today's topic, understanding why Latinas attempt suicide, is of immense interest and importance. The exhaustive research on Latina suicide conducted by Dr. Zayas has just been published by the Oxford University Press in his new book entitled, Latinas Attempting Suicide When Cultures, Families, and Daughters Collide. And the book is available for sale today after the lecture. Using multiple measures of individual and family functioning, along with in-depth interviews, he analyzes Latina suicides and offers a model for understanding and working with young Latinas and their families. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Luis Zayas. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm very glad that you mentioned uh, Fordham and Albert Einstein, because I am a New Yorker. I just happened to be a transplanted to uh, St. Louis uh, about 10 years ago, and uh, now to be transplanted once more to uh, Texas. But uh, my wife and I decided that we would not, never, in fact, sell our New York home. So New York is still our home, and, uh, uh, and we're here for the summer. So thank you very much. Um, well, um, after that fine introduction, I hope I don't let you down. So uh, let, me, uh, let me tell you a little bit about, um, uh, about what, uh, what I want to talk to you about today. And it's, it's something that's been a lifelong passion of mine, uh, lifelong uh, in that uh, it really began in the 1970s when I was a, uh, a younger social worker uh, in those days, uh, working in uh, the Bronx. Uh, uh, the South Bronx and Lower East Side and uh, Spanish Harlem. And um, it, it was such that one of the things we were seeing often were these young Latinas uh, coming to our emergency rooms and uh, outpatient mental health clinics following a suicide attempt. Now, for those of you who remember, some of you were alive then in the 1970s, a lot of you are <laughs> post-1970s kids, um, but if you thought about Latinos, you were really talking about Puerto Ricans in New York City and the 60s and 70s, and then, and then things changed. Um, so, so we began to see this pattern. Um, and what I want to do today is take you, you know, back uh, uh, retrospectively to, to those days and how we got to where we are today and to the research that we're doing. Um, then I want to tell you about the research project that resulted in the book and continues to result in other publications and new findings that we're constantly publishing and we hope it will become the, uh, just the launching pad for the next uh, large grant, which is to look at uh, cross-ethnic comparisons. And then I want to, you know, this might get us into a nice uh, conversation, maybe a rough and tumble one, about the lingering questions that still we have today about the suicide attempts of young Latinas. Um, this is the book that, uh, that I'll be drawing from, which is uh, published earlier this year in 2000, uh, May of 2011. So um, this is what um, things have looked like for young Latinas over the years. But uh, going back to the, the 1970s, we began to see what was then a, this phenomenon that we saw it in our emergency rooms and our clinics where young Latinas were coming uh, to, to our clinics. And we, we thought that um, it was a Puerto Rican thing, OK, because it was so many young Puerto Ricans. And, um, when, when I became aware of this, I would call around to other clinicians around town, New York City, to the other boroughs and say, are you guys getting the same number of girls or are you seeing the same thing? Yeah, we are too. Um, and we would all go back to the literature and there's nothing there. Uh, and going back to the literature in those days uh, meant actually going to the library and going into the stacks and pulling out dusty volumes where things had been bound and maybe, you know, you could get a paper cut, just God forbid. So, but now we have PDFs and online and we download it. So we're set, right? We don't even have to 
needed dust because we have the, just the dust that's on the screen that we have to read through. But otherwise, you know, we had to do that. And um, we, there was nothing really being written. And uh, as I say, we thought it was a, a, a Puerto Rican thing. Um, through the years, though, into the 1980s, as the Dominican population grew, we began to see girls in our emergency rooms and mental health clinics with that same pattern of uh, suicide attempts. So we thought, well, it's clearly not just Puerto Ricans, it's Dominicans, and maybe it's a Caribbean thing, you know, Spanish-speaking Caribbean thing. And we found out uh, over time that it wasn't. In the visit to my family in Miami, I picked up the Miami Herald, and there is this story in the 1990s, actually, uh, I'm sorry, in the early 1990s, late 1980s, of uh, a young Nicaraguan boy and a Cuban girl, or Nicaraguan girl and Cuban boy, who had, uh, had uh, one of these joint suicides because their families, they were 13, 14 years old, their families did not want them together. And so, of course, love, you know, Romeo and Juliet and all of that. Um, uh, these kids uh, suicided together. And, but the background to it was that in the Miami-Dade school uh, district, at the time it was called Miami-Dade, I think it's Metro Miami or, or whatever it is now, um, the, the Latino girls represented like, you know, a small proportion of the entire school system uh, from K to, to 12, and yet they accounted for about 35% of all suicide attempts among kids in the, so, wow, then it wasn't just Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. Now I, I'm seeing Cubans and, and Nicaraguans, I'm reading about them. And, and then little studies in the 1980s began to emerge, again, most of them in the Bronx, but many of them from, uh, several of them from the Southwest uh, and California. And there too, the, there was indication that it was, um, that Mexican girls, that Mexican American girls were attempting suicide at a high rate, and that they represented for inpatient psychiatric, adolescent psychiatric services, they too outnumbered the other groups, and it was suicide that most of them had, uh, that they were hospitalized for. So then I'm thinking, whoa, this is a pan-Latino thing. This is not just about Puerto Ricans, Caribbeans, uh, but really we are, we are looking at a phenomenon that's much greater. So during the decade of the 1980s, um, I finished my PhD and I started write, writing grants um, to try to get to study this phenomenon. However, it was hard to convince the National Institutes, uh, Institutes of Health or the National Institute of Mental Health that it was worth their investing money because there was no evidence whatsoever of this phenomenon. It was just small studies and, you know, and, and clinicians like me who were uh, seeing it. Um, but then in, the in 1991, um, the first youth risk behavior surveillance uh, system uh, was created at uh, Centers for Disease Control. And the, the YRBS is a uh, biennial survey of youth in high schools, typically 14 to, to 17, 14 to 18, freshmen through seniors. And some of you may have participated in those, though you may not know it or remember it, in your classroom. And in, in 1991, um, we began to see that indeed what, I, what we were seeing was now being verified. We were being confirmed, affirmed, if you will, by this national survey. And it's continued since, where the pattern that you see here, where Latinas here in the, uh, in the hashed marks uh, outpaced all other girls, African American, non-Hispanic white girls, Latino males, uh, African American males, and non-Hispanic white males, um, the girls, Latinas, outpaced them all. And so we first found that out in 1991, that is, it was confirmed, but it was in 1995 when the biggest spike occurred during the past two decades. And that's when one in, in, uh, one in five Latinas, 21%, was reporting a suicide attempt. So there was, there was definitely enough confirmation now that this was not just, you know, some cranky social worker in the Bronx who was seeing a lot of girls and, and writing about it and making noise. But in fact, it was happening across our country and that these girls, Latinas, were more likely to, to attempt suicide. Now, what we did see over the years is that, in general, suicide attempts by high school kids went down. Just there was a, one of those so-called secular patterns where the entire nation saw it. But if you look at these, at these bars right up to 2005, just one decade, 
you'll see that Latinas still outnumber the other girls with respect to suicide attempts. So all of those years that we were suspecting it was now being not just confirmed in 1991, 2, and 3, uh, 91, uh, 3, uh, uh, 1991 and 93, but then through 1995 onward, um, it's, it's been something that uh, has continued. Um, and what's, while, while we're looking at the girls here, let me just uh, point out that it's also the case that young Latino males are attempting suicide at higher rates than their uh, non-Hispanic uh, uh, white or African-American counterparts. However, the, 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 the difference is not as dramatic, say, as it is with girls, where in this case they were twice as likely to attempt suicide as other girls versus anywhere from one and one and a half uh, times as likely. But again, th this has continued uh, right up to the present. Well, that's not the present, but. So uh, I'll bring you to the present in a couple of minutes. And so we were thinking of all of these things, but we didn't quite understand it. Then in, in 2003, the National Household Survey on Drug Abuse had this report. It was great. It was really wonderful because it, it, it did a couple of things. It reported that, um, that Latinas were at higher risk for suicide attempts from the ages of 12 to 17. So we're talking about young Latinas not just in high school, but in middle school, okay? And even kind of the upper end of elementary school, um, we, we kind of that the, the suicide attempt occurred there. We also saw, and this was the, the, the most surprising finding, that it was the US born Hispanic girl who was more at risk than the foreign born girls. Okay, and we'll, we can speculate about that. Um, in fact, we have data to suggest that it's not speculation, but we'll come to that in a minute. And that it's the highest risk is in small metropolitan areas versus the large, uh, large metropolitan areas or non-metropolitan areas. Now, of course, you know, as we are in New York, we are the center of the world, the universe. And, uh, you know, I was one of those like you who, who saw the rest of the United States like that New Yorker cover where, you know, it's, it's just the Hudson River and then this vast wasteland until you get to LA. Um, so, so I was one of those and I thought, how could it be? You know, we're seeing more than anybody. Well, you know, the data was speaking to us saying something different. Uh, they, were, they were telling us that, no, it's in the smaller metropolitan areas where they're having more trouble. And, and then, you know, you kind of think about that a lot as we do when you're researching something. You spend your life uh, um, talking about it and, you know, your, your poor family suffers with you on it, because they have to hear about it at dinner. Um, Dad, enough, they would say. Um, but it makes sense, because in a place like New York, there's many, we have, we've been here a long time, Latinos. We've got ethnic agencies. You know, we've got plenty of places to go. Um, uh, if, if I'm a little girl in the Bronx and I have a boyfriend in Brooklyn, well, I can get away and hide out and nobody's gonna notice. Um, and so there's much more kind of uh, support network. But when you're play, living in a place like, uh, like uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts, for example, that's different because there aren't, you know, it's a smaller town and you can't hide uh, as easily. Plus, well, in Lawrence, there are more services than say there are in St. Louis, uh, in St. Louis for, for Latinos. So, so, okay, so I got over my New York centrism and, uh, and, uh, and accepted that it could be uh, greater in metropolitan, uh, smaller metropolitan areas. Um, so I want to bring you back to this, this, uh, this history of, the, of these attempts. So the, the YRBS is a nationally representative sample. It has all the things that most epidemiologists agree makes for good science. And um, in the most recent one, uh, 2011, there'll, there'll be one, actually there's probably one this past spring, uh, one of the surveys that uh, the high schoolers would have completed. The data will not be analyzed, or that is it won't be reported until next summer. So this is the, the, the best I can do for you now. So in 2009, um, the, so I have four questions. The first one is, in, um, in the past year, have you thought about attempting suicide? So it re really reaches for ideation. Are you thinking about attempting suicide? And uh, here, Latinas report about, in 2009, 20% um, of them reported that they did Non-Hispanic white females were close by, and so were the African-American girls. Boys in general uh, were, are lower. And here at the, on the, on the, uh, the right-hand side, um, you see the, uh, all groups, that is boys and girls uh, involved, and still both Latino and Latinas 
uh, attempts, uh, think about suiciding more often than, than other groups. And the African American and the non-Hispanic white are pretty much at the, same, at the same level. So that's just ideation, which for clinicians in this audience worries us because an ideation could lead to a plan, could lead to an act, could lead to a death. So we, when someone's telling you they're thinking about suicide, you take it seriously as a clinician, and I would say as a teacher, a guidance counselor, and a parent, of course, or, or a best friend, which is uh, one of the ways that most of these girls come to our attention through their best friend. The, so then the next question in the, in the YRBS is, okay, so you thought about it, did you, in the past 12 months, did you make a plan to, to, to suicide? And once again, oops, sorry, wrong button. Um, Latinas outrank the others, not by a lot, not by a lot, but sufficient that it continues to draw our attention that they planned it more. But notice here, now when we get the guys involved, that, that margin becomes a little larger than it is for the other two groups. And African American females are right after Latinas, but then when you aggregate them with the, their, their male counterpart, they drop. So that might tell us that something's going on here for those of you who are statisticians and better at that sort of stuff, that something's happening in the non-Hispanic uh, non Caucasian group that causes them to rise despite the fact that the girls are not attempting more, which means that there's something going on there. Um, and incidentally, uh, for you uh, soon-to-be doctoral students, uh, there's a dissertation in Latino male suicide attempts. No one has studied it, and I certainly haven't and there's nothing out there. So if you really want to get a good dissertation topic, think about the boys. Um, the third question in the YRBS is, how many times in the past year did you attempt suicide? The, so it's, it's not just whether you did or not, not a yes or no, but how many times? Unfortunately, the YRBS, when it's reported by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, don't tell you what the range, range is. Um, but just, you know, it's, it becomes a yes or no. And once again, Latinas and African Americans in 2009, now they're almost up there, it's like, this is like 11% and this is like 10.1 or 2%. Um, and uh, non-Hispanic white girls are attempting at, at lower rates. Um, the same thing here, both boys and girls, but notice here the African American and the Latinos are starting to, to match up when you add the boys in with the girls and you look at, at the suicide attempts. So again, we don't know how many suicide att uh, attempts they made in the previous year, only that they did. And then the fourth question, oops, no, I'm sorry, I guess I don't have the fourth question up there, but the fourth question is, um, in the past year, if you attempted suicide, did you need medical attention? And I'm sorry I don't have that slide here, but again, Latinas apparently attempt suicide in ways that bring them to medical attention much more, which suggests something about the seriousness, or what we call in this business uh, lethality. The lethal level of the attempt is greater among Latinas. So um, it's, it's a very troubling thing, and you can imagine you know, uh, coming back from the 70s uh, right up to the present, it's something that really has, has, uh, has uh, concerned me a great deal. Um, now in that paper, that the only papers that we were able to find came from the uh, early 1960s. Um, data that, was, that were collected in, uh, in, the in like 1959, within an 18 month period between 1958 and 59, by Edgar Troutman, a psychiatrist at Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx. And um, in those days, psychiatry and, and some, to some degree psychology needed to label everything. So there was a syndrome for some, everything. So there was the Puerto Rican syndrome, and there were other syndromes, and so uh, Troutman was in that vein, and he called it the suicidal fit. And these were women that had come to Lincoln Hospital uh, following a suicide attempt. Now, these were not teenagers. He was an adult psychiatrist, but most of these women were in their 20s uh, and 30s. And um, what he found about kind of the, the, the characteristics were that there was this, these impulsive attempts to escape from stressful situations, so that the suicide attempt was really just a way to get get out of whatever they felt they were in, a way of escaping. Um, and most often, the women um, uh, attempted suicide through the ingestion of pills or household cleansers. So aspirin, I don't think Tylenol was around in the 50s, um, but it would have been you know, kind of any of the medications and detergents, I don't know, bleach, things like that, that might have brought them to the emergency room. 
Um, what we do have seen in our group is that there's much more, now there's more cutting involved in the suicide attempts, much more risk cutting among Latinas. Uh, although uh, there's less likelihood of taking household cleansers, ingesting pills it continues to be uh, very common among the suicide attempters. And uh, Troutman also found that there was some disturbance in family relations, particularly with a spouse or a mom. So, so that just prior to the suicide attempt in the 1950s, these women had had some kind of blowout or you know, blow up with their moms or with their husbands. Uh, and that that was that precipitated the suicide attempt. So those are the, kind of the background. And what, but when he did the psychiatric exam, he found some interesting things. The women weren't thinking about death. There was a, an impulsive escape without the idea that I want to die or I'm going to die. Um, and in fact, many of the women said that they were not aware of their thoughts. They were not aware of their thoughts at all. Um, and also, many of these women were not really, had no psychotic symptomatology. They were average run-of-the-mill women from the community. So it wasn't like they were in the severe mental illness category, um, but rather kind of somewhat average, average women, if you will. Now, um, just to t test your short-term memory, hang on to this, remember this slide, okay? Because later on we're gonna come back to some of our findings and what it tells us about what we, ha what we now know that uh, Troutman uh, knew then or learned then. So after many years of um, writing grants and being rejected, and so this is part of the academic world, right? You know, you get a lot of rejection notes from, uh, from journals and then they might even say, well, revise and resubmit, but that doesn't guarantee you're gonna get in. So you know how that is, and if you, if you have a, if your ego is weak, don't enter this business, you know, go somewhere else, hedge funds or something else like that, you know, uh, because you gotta get used to rejection. And after many grants, uh, I, I wrote at least 10 years worth of grants before 2005 when I was finally funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. Now they were persuaded, hmm, we do have a problem here, okay. Okay, buddy, go ahead and test it out and see what you can. And so we, we, um, we were funded to do a five-year study um, that asked, well, in part, asked these two of the main questions. We asked, why do some Latinas attempt suicide and other Latinas don't when you hold other things uh, uh, to some degree constant, where they live, family, place of birth, you know, that sort of thing, age group. So we were holding a lot of things constant so what was it about some Latinas attempting and others not attempting, considering the, the, the kind of conditions they both, they both existed in? Um, and so that was our first, so, so this becomes therefore an intra-ethnic intra study. We wanted to study Latina uh, 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 against Latina. In our next study, we want to then look at you know, all three of those columns, you know, non-Hispanic whites, non-Hispanic blacks, and Latinas, and look at what the differences are. And um, I'm hoping that with the success of this study, we will be able to get funded for that one. So that was the first question. The other one was, we want to understand what the elements of the suicide attempt are. Troutman had given us some basic you know, uh, ideas about it, but we wanted to test out what was really going on. And so we were funded, I hired a team, uh, and we, we got going. Uh, and so I want to give you something about the theoretical basis of our study, okay? So one of the things that we, uh, came at it from uh, is that we're talking about adolescence. Therefore, we have to understand what are the key developmental issues in, of adolescence. And over the years, we've had all sorts of different ideas about the Sturm und Drang of, of adolescence, about the separation individuation phase, second in, uh, 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 separation individuation phase, all sorts of things. But um, I'm, I'm, um, I'm grateful to the, the developmental psychologists of the past decade who really distilled it into really the issue of autonomy versus connection and relatedness. Because in, in essence, the struggle of adolescence is indeed independence, but not independence in a way that's not connected. Um, believe it or not, uh, those of you who are near at, or just got out of adolescence, um, you know, you all want to stay with us, the parents. And we want you to stay, but please don't pick our pockets while you're at it, you know? Uh, right? So. Um, so there's this desire to be more independent, okay? But there's also a need to be connected. And so that was one theoretical stream that we followed. And we thought, well, you know, Latina girls are not that different from other girls in that they wanna be 
their own women, but they also want mom and dad and brother and sister and uncle, you know, tios and tias and everybody else in the picture. So there's a, a, a desire also to remain connected. You know that book that the, the title of it is something like, you know, I hate you, but now would you drive, drive me to the mall or something? Do you know that book? Something like that, right? So, so that's, that's a good way of, of describing that adolescent. The other one is that we, we followed our, our, our uh, notions about developmental uh, systems theory, which really says that it's not like we're victims of the environment. We in interact with the environment. We are both you know, um, uh, 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 active agents and, 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 uh, and, and passive recipients or active recipients of what's going on. So we influence our environment as much as the environment influences us, or not necessarily as much, but there's a reciprocal in influence. So we, we, we know that, so we're not holding a harmless, uh, as they say in the law, uh, these young girls. They, they've, got, you know, they've got their problems, and they're part of the reason we thought that the suicide attempt comes around. We can't blame everybody else. We also, um, because we're, we were all family researchers, we thought, well, the best way also to capture this developmental system is also through family systems, which says that you know, whenever there's changes in families, um, things happen, and that change is inevitable. Uh, children grow and get older, parents grow and get older, stuff happens in life, divorce, death, new jobs, moves, um, and so on, and the family has to be able to manage all of those changes. Parents have to, of course, adapt to their children's uh, 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 growth, development, and what the kids need, whether it's in school, uh, going from brownies to Girl Scouts to whatever after that uh, follows. Um, and so the three key areas are, can a family remain cohesive during these changes? And is it flexible enough to remain cohesive and adapt to the demands of its growing family, uh, that is, maturing uh, family? And, um, and what's the communication like in these families? So that these three, kind of, these three principles, cohesion, flexibility, and communication, are very important in, in family functioning and in family systems theory. And um, uh, most of this comes out of uh, uh, Olson's uh, circumplex model, which places families high on cohesiveness or high on flexibility, and that basically the balance should be between cohesiveness and, and flexibility. Um, then, of course, and, and this is great when I come to talk in New York, because I, I feel uh, with, like I'm with kindred spirits. If I, when, I, when I try to talk about culture in St. Louis, they, they look at me funny. Um, <laughs> In part because it's, it's, you know it's not quite as multi-ethnic a city as as New York and the New York area or heck the whole Northeast. Um, so so um, we look at this also that uh, there's a cultural basis for this research, not just that Latinas are attempting suicide, but what is it about it that's coming from the culture? And so what we do know is that culture influences our psychological representation of the world which feelings we can feel and not necessarily, well, feel, acknowledge, and show is very much influenced by culture. So we may look across cultures and say, wow, that, that's a funny way of expressing that feeling. But they look at us and they say, gosh, it's funny how they express that same feeling. Or why is it that the British have a stiff upper lip and we Puerto Ricans dance salsa with our headphones on in the subway by ourselves? But, you know, so, so, you know, it's like, you know, what, what emotions can you display and, and, and you know, uh, so that, that, that's part of it. It sets a limit of the tolerance for emotions. So the, which emotions are salient? Which ones can I express at what level? And what does it take? At What's the threshold? And different uh, uh, cultures give us different thresholds for, for the expression of that. Um, for example, you know, in the, uh, in the research that was done early on on, the, um, on depression, the early... Uh, uh, epidemiological catchment uh, studies, we were finding that Puerto Ricans were more depressed than other groups. Now, we couldn't believe that, okay, because the beautiful island, the, the music, our food, what could be depressing about that? Well, what happened was when, when our colleague Gloria Canino at the University of Puerto Rico began to look deeper into the data, it was that Puerto Ricans tend to endorse items so if you ask a Puerto Rican, how do you feel today? Well, my back hurts. That's not that depressed. They're telling you their back hurts, which is something about which emotions we can express. So here are the Puerto Ricans say, do you get back aches? Yes. Does your stomach hurt? Yes. Do you get headaches? Yes. Not any more than anybody else, except we endorse those. And so it appeared as though 
the Puerto Ricans are more depressed than others. But when Lorisa and her team did this uh, statistical whatever they do, they discovered that if you look at it statistically, Puerto Ricans are no more, no less depressed than anybody else. Of course, that was great news for all of us. But it tells you something about the expression of, of emotions and the threshold. We also have these, you know, culture gives us these lexicons. How we express our emotions, we call them idioms of distress. We, around the world, there are cultures with all sorts of different uh, um, um, idioms of distress from, uh, I was reading a, a, in Kenya about a pepper in the brain, or, or maybe it was heat in the brain, and in Pakistan it was a peppery feeling in the head. Um, these are all idioms of distress. Uh, when we talk about running amok, amok is a, if you look at the, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, at the end you'll have these, these uh, uh, culture-bound syndromes, and they talk about how these different, uh, these different uh, idioms of distress that are related to the culture, or specific cultures. Hmm. Of course, culture tells us something about um, how we're supposed to interact, especially between child and child, adult and child, you know, child and stranger, adult and child and other child. So all of these are pretty much based uh, on culture, and most of them will tell you, you know, share, you know, that's something that, but there are other elements uh, on the rules of interaction, like uh, my 92-year-old father, when I call him, I still ask him, I always say bendición to start the conversation, which is to ask for his benediction, you know, um, I just do that, and neither of us go to church. But, you know, but it's, it's part of, you know, it's the interaction. That's an indication of my respect for him, so I ask him for his blessing. Um, and so culture tells us how family structure, how we're supposed to interact, and you know, how kids are, are, are reared, and that these family interactions prime and shape our affects, which gets us to, the, to that first one. So these are the kind of the background uh, that we, um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, theories that we use. Um, and I'm gonna take off my jacket if you don't mind, I feel like a Baptist preacher up here on a <laughs> hot Sunday afternoon somewhere. Um, so, so this was the, the, the model that we began with, a very simple linear model because that's the best I could do. Um, but you know, some of the things I've talked to you about, the adolescent development, culture and cultural traditions, how families function, that somehow these created the social, uh, cultural and family environment that the girl is growing up in, learning from, coping within, and being affected. But we have to remember, adolescent development doesn't happen just in the home. There's this interaction at school and in the media and all around, so that there's, there are all sorts of influences coming in. And depending on the functioning in this realm, she develops a certain level of, uh, of uh, emotional vulnerability or strength or resiliency or thriving or capacity to, to, to handle it. And so we call that psychosocial functioning. So these set the stage for how vulnerable she will be. And then there's a, a crisis event. Remember, uh, Troutman said that was always related to a spouse or a mom, uh, that those are the things that triggered the, the events. So um, we think that there, was, there would be this, this crisis event in the family that would trigger uh, the, the kind of, that uh, not would trigger the uh, emotional vulnerability, but that would be uh, whether the girl was able to deal with, the, uh, with the, uh, the crisis or not, how able, she would either be a suicide attempter or not, or find other ways of, of dealing with life. So that was the, 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 the kind of conceptual model that we worked from. Again, some of this uh, I've just talked about, we have to add in issues of acculturation, how different the girls are from their parents with respect to acculturation to this, uh, to this culture, the US uh, uh, mainstream society. Issues of immigration, so even though we may have second and third generation girls in our study, immigration, um, though it might not have happened in, in say, one of the, the um, generations in the home, it has its ver reverberations, where it still, it still uh, affects people and families beyond. Um, of course, there's socioeconomics, and um, we measure socioeconomics in our study uh, uh, by parental education rather than how much they made, because that was, we didn't think it was a good enough proxy for what we were looking for. And of course, the, the issue of what generation, was she foreign born uh, or was she US born and was she born to uh, immigrant parents or US born parents would make her you know, second or later generation. Um, and so that, that too was uh, something we kept in mind. 
Again, emotional vulnerability, oftentimes we see in, uh, in, 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 uh, in girls or actually anybody who, who's uh, uh, prone to uh, having hard times with crises is that they have low self-esteem, there's a sense of hopelessness. Many of the girls uh, have this, we, we had seen in the clinics, an impulsivity to the act, kind of very much like what Troutman was, was, uh, had reported. We found this uh, notion of emotional dysregulation, the, 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 especially around anger, where the feeling of anger was too much to bear. And there, were, there was insufficient uh, ego capacity, okay, or, 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 or functional capacity to deal with that, that very strong emotion uh, of anger, particularly. Now, um, before you start jumping to the conclusion that we're talking about borderline personality, we're not. Um, we're talking about a different dis emotional dysregulation that may or may not lead to a borderline personality, but in our girls, we weren't, uh, that was not uh, uh, so much the case. And of course, depression and anxiety, uh, as you can imagine. And we knew from our um, practice and what we had just learned before the study that many of the girls that we had seen had poor coping skills. Um, they would withdraw socially uh, and be in the room by themselves. They would engage in wishful thinking. Oh, I wish, you know, there would be a knight in shining armor or something like that um, to take me away. Um, they might blame others for everything that happens, externalizing the, the fault. And then they might engage in very passive coping, um, letting, letting things happen to them, but not really kind of taking proactive stances to, to uh, 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 deal with the stress. Again, we come back to autonomy and relatedness, and I want to, we broke down autonomy uh, into three ways. Cognitive, which has to do with the thinking, which is perhaps the most private of our, of our autonomy, uh, strides in autonomy, which is to think for ourselves. So, um, you know, the, the adolescent will uh, challenge their parents around um, the thoughts, whether it's Republican versus Democrat, or as in my case, often was, why don't you give me the car keys? And what's wrong with that? No, son, it's not you, it's the other kids. But that doesn't make sense, Dad. So there's all this cognition, and they've got abstract thinking capacities, they're gonna challenge me. But then research came along and showed us, as we know, that the male brain doesn't develop as well, so there's all sorts of gaps. So I would tell my teenage son, son, your brain is just simply, the bottom line is your brain is not well developed. And so, um, so, <laughs> So uh, he became a Republican. No, he, he's, uh, he, he's doing something else. So, um, but he didn't go into social worker psychology. I wonder why, right? Um, uh, and then it's a behavioral, you know, that I want to do what I want to do, okay? Um, and that's where the parenting needs to set limits. Okay, you can do so much uh, and, and whatnot. And then there's the emotions. Having my own emotional feelings, which is another very private level of autonomy, because now the adolescent begins to extend the, 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 their affection, especially romantic, to people outside of the family. It's not just love of my family, siblings, aunts, and uncles, cousins, but ooh, there's this guy, okay, um, that, that uh, I'm falling for. So there are this range, and then again, uh, relatedness, the attachment, the need for closeness, which we all know is fundamental to human beings, the, the attachment, uh, the internal working model of our attachments are powerful, they endure over time and distance and so on. Um, but also, you know, kids need some sense of organization in the home, this predictability that, that they can be assured of and consistency in their lives so that if they know they push the button or the limits here, they also know the consequences. And when, when there's lack of a consistency in that way, we, we could see trouble where the child never knows whether they're really gonna be reprimanded for something minor or something major. And as parents, our, you know, the idea is to provide as much consistency and predictability as we possibly can. And, and by the way, all of this too, too, I mean, we see it in our clinical practice. We, we try to teach adolescents and their parents these sorts of uh, principles and how to, how to interact well. Um, so we, we also knew that in, in the adolescent's life, they need to have uh, mentors. They need to have people who teach them, who tutor them, who guide them, who know the adolescent's cultural landscape, who know what's going on. Not that you know, any of us parents will ever really know exactly what's going on. Um, it wasn't until much later that I discovered where the kids used to go drinking and my son would join them in the, in the woods near our home. 
um, but I only found out much later. So there are things that I just wouldn't know, but I knew that there was drinking going on, I just didn't know where. Um, and then, you know, a mentor is inspiring, brings some zest into your life, it gives you, I wanna be like this person. So it's important that despite their, the, the, the adolescent's reluctance to admit that their parents are mentors, teaching, guiding, you know, even inspiring, they wouldn't, my kids would never have admitted that. Um, but you know, they, they still don't, so I'm, I'm deluding myself that I was inspiring. Uh, so, but what the heck, you know. Um, so, so um, but this is an important part of, of what adolescents need. The other one is the, the sense of mutuality, and we could call this reciprocity. We use the term mutuality, it was, the, it was uh, advanced by uh, uh, writers at the Stone Center at Wellesley, Women's uh, uh, Research Center at Wellesley. And, um, the, the notion of this re reciprocal exchange of affect, respect, and admiration that goes on in, in relationships, in good, healthy relationships, that you know, this mutuality there's involves a level of emotional attunement to one another, and that the people can take the perspective of the other. I can understand my partner, and she can understand me, and at least or understand where I'm coming from, that sort of thing. And so that, those we thought also were important aspects of, of, of our study. Uh, again, fam family uh, uh, functioning, but we also looked at, we use a measure, a cultural measure of familism, which is really about family cohesion, uh, the sense of obligations that Latinos have for their parents. Uh, by the way, it's not to say that familism doesn't ex ex exist in other cultures. Um, it exists in many, in most cultures actually. It just gets expressed differently according to, to cultures. Um, and so, so the sense of obligation, uh, familism enforces traditions, beliefs, uh, child rearing patterns, family interaction, and our sense of identity, you know, who we are. We're, I'm from the Zayas family, and that implies all sorts of things, and it gives me a sense of continuity and an, a, a kind of an affiliation with, with others. And as I mentioned, family functioning, which, uh, which are the same things as I, I mentioned earlier. So here's the study. We had done smaller studies, but this was the, the big one where we um, recruited uh, Latinas between the ages of 12 and 19 uh, because we really wanted to be able to capture a broad range from early adolescence to late adolescence, but also having been informed by the National Household Survey on drug abuse that uh, even 13-year-old even Latinas were attempting suicide. We wanted to go, uh, we wanted to take the whole uh, span, the age, uh, adolescent span. And these were all girls in New York City where, where I uh, have conducted most of my research. Um, and uh, we had two groups, the suicide attempters, the so-called clinical group, who had reported a suicide attempt within the uh, uh, previous six months, okay? We had actually started out with three months, but it was getting harder to find subjects, so we expanded it. We wanted three months because of issues of, of memory and recall and things like that, when we would go deeply into, into what had happened and a comparison group of girls who had never attempted suicide. Again, all from the same neighborhoods uh, and uh, 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 zip codes uh, in, in actually four boroughs, the uh, Bronx, Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn. We didn't go to Staten Island. Um, and we did one-time uh, in-depth interviews um, and, and, a, and a questionnaire of objective measures, and we got in fa a girls, mothers, and their fathers in the study. And we, this is a mixed method study in which we use both qualitative and quantitative uh, analyses. Um, okay, so the measures, demographics, uh, self-esteem, measures of self-esteem, internalizing and externalizing behavior, familism, acculturation. We looked at parent-adolescent conflict, but only from the adolescent's perspective. That's the child, uh, conflict behavior questionnaire, the CBQ. The mutuality. And in the mutuality, that, that measure, uh, what it does is it asks you, it'll have questions like, when we're talking about me, my mother is apt to, and then you finish out the sentence. Or when we talk about my mother, I am apt to. So what you're doing is kind of getting this bi-directional process and what's going on in, in these people, uh, in, in this relationship. And we did that for both girls and their mothers and girls and their fathers. Um, we asked the girls about the parental uh, communication and support. Um, incidentally, here, this is uh, the, the mutuality we talked about. We use this as a measure, uh, a group of measures of mentoring. How well do, do, how affectionate are my parents? How much do they communicate? How much support do they give me? 
So the girls were asked about your father and about your mother uh, in separate. And then we, we did a, a, a scale of family environment, again, conflict, cohesion, and control, who controls uh, the family. So here is our sample. Okay, we, we managed to get 122 girls uh, attempters in total and 110 who had never attempted. And they, um, they had never uh, attempted, they'd never been to a hospital for a uh, suicide attempt. It's not that they hadn't ideated, they might have thought about suicide, but at least that they had never acted on it. Um, we recruited um, uh, 86 moms and two grandmothers. Um, Actually, I'm sorry, two of those, those were 84 moms and two, and two grandmothers. Um, and then 19 fathers, and here among the non-attempters, 110, 83, and 17 moms and, uh, and dads. Now, we had set it up so that when we went to the qualitative analysis, these in-depth ethnographic interviews where we really began to ask the girl what was happening before, what happened during, what was the experience of your suicide attempt, and so on. We're really getting much more in-depth about their suicide attempt. Um, we, we got 73 of the girls to agree, 46 of their moms, and 16 of their fathers. Now, this is, this is you know, the desperate attempts of a researcher when he has fathers available to him. Ordinarily, we should have gotten the same proportions, but I told my team, if the father's in the, stu in the study, just get him in. You know, I'll, I'll take the lumps you know, um, from all the journal reviewers when they say, well, you, know, you didn't do the same with the fathers as you did with the moms. And, no, I, I don't care, but I, got, I wanted to get as many fathers into the study as possible. So you can see that's why only three of the dads weren't here and three of the dads didn't do the other uh, the qualitative uh, component. So that was our... Uh, that was our uh, our sample overall, and again, they came from the, the four boroughs. Here are the basic demographics, and what's interesting is the girls were all, because, you know, that, we're, that, that our girls are, 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 no, uh, are no worse than anybody else except the suicide attempt, unfortunately. Um, more results. So remember, affection, communication, and support really sp deals with, uh, with mentoring, and the attempters, um, had lower scores, on all, reported lower scores on all of these. So they're being asked, um, how affectionate is your mom? How much does she communicate? And your dad, how much do they support? And the attempters reported much lower, uh, 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 than, much lower results or, or, or mentoring than, their, uh, than the non-attempters. And attempters rated their mothers, however, okay, the raters, atten uh, them, I'm sorry, the, the attempters rated their mothers significantly lower in mentoring then none attempters rated their mothers. Okay, so what we have is both groups of girls are saying, you know, our moms are not great mentors. But the gap between the attempters was larger than the non attempters. So in general, kids will say, well, you know, my parents, they really don't understand me. I know they love me, but they don't really understand me, and things like that. But it was worse for the, for the attempters. Again, nothing that kind of would, would, uh, would uh, 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 you know, surprise us in that regard. Here's what's interesting, is that remember, this is issue of reciprocity, which has to do with the communication that goes on and how much emotional connection there was and attunement between parents uh, and kids. And um, I'm just gonna show you right here, though, just the mutuality with the mothers, in large part because statistically we had uh, many more mothers than, than fathers, so our statisticians could do more work with the data that we had than with fathers, and I'll come to that back in a minute, come back to that in a minute. But, um, Attempters reported that you know, they had lo lower mutuality with their moms than the non-attempters did. Okay. All girls in general reported their, their mothers were lower in mutuality. No girl, no adolescent rather, will ever admit that their parents understand them. And we parents know we understand our kids, right? But the kids, no girl, whether she was an attempter or not, agreed that her mother really fully understood her. Well, my mother tries and things like that. However, but the disparity was greater between the attempters and their mothers than between the non-attempters and their mothers. Again, so, you know, the difference was greater between the attempters that there really is less mutuality between us than the, the non-attempters. So while both girls complained about the, the, the lack of mutuality, um, it was much greater among the, um, the, the attempters. Now, when we looked at it from the mother's side, here's an interesting picture. Okay, the attempters' moms perceive themselves to be attuned to their daughters. Yes, I understand my daughter. We're like best friends. Oh, yes, she can always come to me, and I think she does always come to me. 
And the girls were saying, oh, no way. <laughs> My mom doesn't understand a lick about me. So there was that discrepancy even between the daughters. So remember, there's this issue of can, can we talk? Can we take each other's perspective? We really can't in the attempters. Whereas the non-attempters, the non-attempters' moms perceive themselves to be attuned to their daughters, just like the attempters' moms. But here, the difference was that the daughters agreed. My mom understands me. I know she's old-fashioned, and she has those ways about her from Santo Domingo, or wherever we come from, and she thinks it's still like that, and that a girl should still wear her skirt you know, low, and things like that. But you know what? I know she does it out of love for me. So there was a capacity to feel that what her mother was doing was out of love, a perspective that we didn't see happening up here. So we, we begin to see the divergence between the adolescent and her, and her parents. And why does mutuality matter is because in this, in this uh, scale, the mutual psychological development questionnaire, it's a six point scale, and with, one, with every one point, um, that is, it goes from uh, uh, one to seven, I guess it's at six points, or zero to six, I don't recall. Um, and so the, the higher you are in the score, the more mutuality. So with every one point increase in mutuality, there was a 57% decrease in the probability of being an attempter. All right? So as therapists, we want kids to communicate. We want families to talk to one another, to listen, to be attuned emotionally, to, to stop the parents from talking so that they can hear what's going on in their children's lives and the kid can describe it. But also we tell the kid, keep quiet so you can hear your parents' stories about their adolescence. I, I, in the book, um, I mentioned, uh, I describe a scene uh, in, uh, I think it was the fall of 2009 when I was in El Centro, California, which is right down there at the border in Imperial Valley, interviewing these uh, Mexican moms. And one of them was a grandmother, and she, would, she kept referring to, you know, we're, it's two different adolescences, dos adolescencias, the one that I went through in Mexico and the one my grandchildren and my daughters are going through here. And it was so eloquent because it was two different places, but it was two different cultural experiences of the adolescents. And so by, by kind of getting, getting, and by the way, these were all uh, really healthy families that I was interviewing. So you got a sense that these mothers understood their daughters and their daughters, despite their, their uh, uh, murmurings and resistance to the fact that their brothers had liberties and you know, uh, freedoms that they didn't have and you know, were allowed to do things, these girls were really uh, strongly tied to their moms in, in very good ways, at least the ones in El Centro. Um, we try to look at mutuality with fathers, but we didn't have the statistical uh, uh, material for it. There was insufficient data. But what we did find is that attempters express greater mutuality with their fathers than with their mothers. My dad understands me more. He's motion, more emotionally attuned. Attempters also said their fathers were much better mentors. But the problem was that many of the fathers, and this is, by the way, this is in the um, questionnaires. So all 122 girls, uh, oh, well, 100, uh, 232 girls, both attempted and attempted, completed this mutuality related to their father. But many of the fathers were absent in the adolescent's life. So it was easy to understand, you know, the parents, the fathers were divorced, they were in prison, living with others, you know, maybe now with a new family. So he spent, you know, 15 minutes on the phone with her. Ay, mija, te quiero mucho. Oh, you're going to be doing well. Oh, you're going to be the best. You're going to be the next Sonia Sotomayor you know, in, in the US or something like that. And then he would get off the phone and the next inmate would pick up the phone and call. But you know, something like that. So, so it was very different, you know. And, and what happened to the, the other 23 hours a day? Moms, right? They had to take care of the girls. So you can understand why there's always much more, there was much more friction between the adolescents and their mothers. If their fathers had been in the home more, we might have seen that similar friction. We don't know, but we can only speculate. Um, and by the way, you know, uh, 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 Deborah Tannen's book, um, You're Wearing That, uh, it's wonderful reading because it talks about mother-daughter's re relationships and it's really how entangled they are uh, in ways that tell us something also about young Latinas and their moms, in ways that, that daughter-son relationships are, uh, you know, I'm uh, sorry, uh, father-son and father-daughter relationships are very different from mother-daughter relationships which are unique uh, and of themselves um, and the slightest thing, you know, on one, one hand, the moms and daughters are talking to each other about things. So, so, okay, so, and this is a, uh, Deborah Tannen writes about this, and it happened in my home. So my, our daughters will call, I pick up the phone. 
hi, honey, hi, hi. yeah, yeah, you know what, yeah, I need a new computer, okay, I'll send one. He says, let me talk to mom, that's about 30 seconds, right? And then there's 35 minutes, 45 minutes with mom about that sequence. Is that the one with the green ones or the red ones? Or with this kind of bluish, oh yeah, I love that one. And this goes on, but you know, then with one minor um, mistake by mom, all hell breaks loose in that relationship. So one, our second daughter, who was a fashion designer for a while before she became a teacher, wised up. Um, she came down and said she was going into Manhattan with her funky outfit on, and my, my wife said, what a beautiful outfit. That looks great, Amanda. Wow, oh, thanks, Mom, I like it. She says, are you going to work in that? That was breakfast. So my son and I picked up our oatmeal. We went to the other room because we knew that was, the, that was the beginning of the end of that breakfast because mothers and daughters have that. Um, um, okay, so the crisis event. Now we're going to get back to the issue that, that, that Troutman presented us. It was often a prolonged tension, fights with, uh, with uh, daughters, uh, uh, between the daughters and their parents, often related to boyfriend dating and sexuality. Remember, this is... It's not about sexuality, it's not dating, it's about autonomy. Um, and that, that that's in, in, in relatedness. And the intense struggle just prior to the attempt. And the girl often felt guilty that she was the cause of all of this. Um, and I realize I'm running over time and people are leaving, so I'm gonna try to run through these. The, the themes of the crisis were often related to things like the girl's behavior is a, a source of the family problem, breaking the rules, lacking in her responsibilities, there were things like issues of privacy, girls' romantic relationships, that, that were all kind of in, uh, uh, involved in this struggle uh, that led to a suicide attempt. There, there were some girls who reported a certain favoritism of a, of a sibling. Didn't, we didn't detect any gender difference. It could be a, a sister, it could be a brother. And so the girl has de develops this agitated state. She feels trapped. And a lot of this is almost reminiscent of Troutman's work. Um, and, and a sense of helplessness that then, you know, there's these overwhelming and often contradictory emotions that occur, that get funneled together, that lead to this emotional experience. And, but we asked our non-attempters, describe a recent fight or crisis you had at home. The, like, the biggest blowout you can remember having. And while they may have felt all of these, they didn't attempt suicide because the families were able to resolve and they themselves were able to deal with the crisis event. Um, as one of our girls told us, I got all these feelings in me, on me, and everything. They build up until I can't take it anymore. And when we studied the, by the way, let me just give you some contours of this. We found that the girls, like Troutman, weren't thinking about death. The, although the, we just published a paper, the more lethal the attempt, the more, um, the, kind of the, the, the more disturbed or troubled the girl was. We... Um, we, we also saw that the girls sometimes talked about this numbing sensation, that they weren't, they weren't really thinking at the time of the suicide attempt. Um, so there was a lot of what Troutman is talking about, but uh, kind of elaborated differently. So the meanings of the suicide attempts, many of the girls talked about self-punishment and self-blame. I was thinking, oh, I should just kill myself. I'm not worth it anymore. Um, this is a girl who had cut herself with a, you know, those pencil sharpeners. She took, broke off the plastic and had the uh, uh, thing. I wanted to kill myself. Uh, I didn't want to cause any more problems for my father. I felt so bad for everything. And this was a, a pretty uh, uh, tragic situation in that the reason she attempted suicide was because her father was arrested, because she had called the police on him because he was beating up her mother who was pregnant. And then when the police got there, they found his stash of drugs and, and handguns. So she's, you know, they took him away in handcuffs. And she's feeling that, that's, that she was the problem. Now her mother's saying, but now I don't have a husband. So it, it, she felt very guilty about this. Uh, it was an emotional release. I have so much pain inside, it's like, it's kind of like I cry inside. I guess when I cut myself, I feel like I'm letting endless words or anything through the blade. I'm taking out my pain. Revenge, I went to rub it in my mom's face. I was like, that's why I went to the bathroom and swallowed a bottle of pills. This is a 13 year old who had taken 11 Tylenol with codeine. Uh, and of course she was rushed to the emergency room. Uh, control, it was like a breath of fresh air for me because it's like my mom wasn't the one who was hurting me, like she didn't have control over the hurt I felt. So there was this, now the, the I've got control. What we didn't hear and we didn't kind of uh, concur on was this notion of a cry for help, which is, has been historically what people talk about in suicide attempts. So there's a lot of implications for treatment. We can talk about that later, but I want to get to um, this last slide, which is the questions that we still have. 
is this really a suicide attempt or is a cultural idiom of distress? We, we had girls who often recanted in the emergency room, oh, I didn't write, attempt suicide, but somebody had to make that judgment. And so when we do have suicide attempts, there's a clinical judgment that has to be made about intent. Because there might have been the intent of, of, the, of suicide, but you know, because now she's in trouble and she might get uh, uh, hospitalized, oh no, no, I was just upset. And so they, oh, I wasn't trying to kill myself. So there are that, and that's kind of those, those kind of recantations that we have to, we have to um, uh, as clinicians, figure out where the truth really is, where the level of intent. Um, we wonder if it's a so dissociative-like uh, experience, because many of the girls were talking about uh, numbness, and it's in the book, you know, feeling numb, they didn't know what they were thinking about, very much like Troutman, but in Troutman's days, we weren't talking, we were talking about hysteria, we weren't talking about dissociative experiences. So is this something, you know, the suicide attempt, something dissociative in nature? Because almost to a girl, they would tell us that they weren't kind of in their bodies or in their minds at the time of the suicide attempt. Um, and we still have the question, which is our next grant, why do they attempt more, why do Latinas attempt more than girls of other races and ethnicities? And how different are the attempts of Latinas com in comparison to other, other teenage girls? These are the, you know, cut up of the questions that we want to ask. And then there's that dissertation temptation for you. What is the peril for Latino males in suicide attempts? Um, those are the questions we have. This is the great team of people that work with me on this study. And uh, I'll stop there and take your questions. Wait, wait, wait. There's an, an ad from our sponsor.